at consistently faithful to the Lord, but He expects that from us. We also need to be faithful to Him with our promise. So if you have asked the Lord to give you a job, you prayed hard that God will give you a job, and then finally He gave you the job that you're praying for, now He expects you to honor Him through the job that you got. Some other faith, when they look for a job, they specifically say, I cannot work on these particular days of the week or the month because this is my right as a religious person. I have a right to exercise my religion. Take it or leave it. And most companies, they honor that. All, you have to, all they have to do is they have to say, I can't make it today, that particular day. But most Christians sometimes, we can't do that because, I, I, know, I know for some reason. But God is expecting us to be faithful to Him, to honor Him after He blessed us. He expects us to stand for Him as a testimony. And so here, Boaz he went beyond his legal obligations to help Ruth and Naomi. He's the person that he's the first person that could say and has the right to say, I don't have anything to do with you. I'm okay with my life. I'm rich. I don't have need of anything. But then his heart is so burdened. And so here's the picture of Boaz, the picture of the God that is gracious and that is loving. And even the mistakes that we make can be turned into good by God when we are faithfully committed to Him. And so when you are experiencing troubles and problems and, and sickness and just a lot of mountains in this life, don't blame yourself. Just examine what God is trying to tell you in that situation. And God sometimes refine us through our sickness, through our problems, through bitterness, through the hurts. He's reminding us that He is our great healer, that His grace is always sufficient, and that when He reminds us of our unfaithfulness, it's actually a demonstration of His great love. Remember the Bible says, whom God loves, He chastens, right? He reminds if you're a parent, you don't want your kid, your child to go astray. So when they make mistakes, you discipline them. You time out them. You tell them what's the right thing to do, and that's not the right thing to do. And that's exactly what God is telling us. The second thing that we learn in this chapter is that we also learn that God often uses the very person or the very people who pray for others to help the people that they're praying for. Did I get you confused with that? Okay. Meaning, if you pray for someone, be ready to be an instrument, to be an answer to the prayer. Now, go, go back to chapter 2, verse 12. I mentioned this last Sunday. But chapter 2, verse 12, Boaz mentioned in the front of Ruth, while she was gleaning, while she was in the field, Verse 12 says, the Lord repay you. This is Boaz saying, because he realized that Ruth was a very honorable woman. Verse 12 says, the Lord repay your work, meaning her being faithful to Naomi, not departing, not letting her go, but staying with her all the way. And then it says, and a full reward be given you by the Lord, God of Israel, under whose wings you have come. For refuge. So when Boaz said, may the Lord repay your work, your goodness, your good deeds, Boaz was saying in himself, to himself, I am ready to be part of that, of the answer. And what happened? Exactly in chapter 4, exactly what he prayed for. So Boaz says, may the Lord repay you. And he was saying to himself, I could be that man. 
And I want to be that man, to be an answer. But then there's another man who is closer. So Boaz's prayer was answered. So in your life, have you ever prayed to God that he would help other people? And have you also thought to yourself, Lord, if you're going to use me, I'll be willing to be your instrument. So when you pray for someone, when you say, I'll pray for you, you have a need, you have a, a financial need, and you have extra money, then don't say, Lord, please use my other brother to provide for her or for him. You are the one that's there. God is giving you the, the privilege and the opportunity to be a blessing and of help. So as I pray, God urges me and shows me the way to help. The next thing that we learn here is that we also see that God's grace and, the, and His care does not mean that we're not going to do anything at all. Again, in Ruth chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, shall I not seek, seek security for you that it may be well with you? Shall I not do something? And then verse 2 says, Now Boaz, whose young women you were with, is, not our, is he not our relative? In fact, he is winnowing barley tonight at the dressing floor. Naomi is aware of all the activities that is going there, that is going on, especially with Boaz. So, Naomi was very active. Boaz was very active as well. Being busy with God has entrusted to him. But God works through us. We just don't pray and then we just wait there. We have to, we're not helping God when we do something. But we keep going in this life, trusting Him, and He will show us along the way what we need to do. And we take active role in working out our problems, our lives, and our struggles in this life. Because we know that His grace will keep us through in this life struggles, in this life ahead of us. And then we also see that we also see that there is a cost for helping other people. Just like what Boaz was ready to do. Now going back to chapter 4, beginning from verse 6. <clears throat> and the close relative said, I cannot redeem it. Remember I explained that already because he's, gonna, he's not going to profit anything from that. So Boaz said, okay, if you're not going to redeem it, I will. And that means he's going to lose money in his life, in his business, in his account. Okay? So, verse 9, it says, And Boaz said to the elders and all the people, You are witnesses this day that I have acquired the property of Naomi. And with that is Ruth. She will become my wife. There was a cost to Boaz. He had to pay for a piece of land that he will not own. Because by the time Naomi gave birth to Obed, that's Obed's property. Automatically. Because he just fulfilled the role of Malin, Ruth's husband that died. So what do we get from this? What, is, what has Christ done for us? Everything, right? He did everything for us. He didn't reserve anything. Christ did it for us. He gave his life for us. So if you are in a situation where you are going to give away some of your resources to other people, and the, the sure thing is that there's not going to be any return to you. But did you know that when you help other people without them helping you back is that you are actually sending your riches and your resources ahead of you in heaven? It's called generosity. It's called being generous to those who are in it. And this is exactly what Boaz did. 
He's ready. He's ready to sacrifice some of his money. And the sacrifice that Christ did for us is there's no amount that we can repay him except our lives, except our lives to be a living sacrifice for him. And then we also see in this chapter that God's hand is in our lives, even if our focus seems to be on another. Let's look at chapter 14, I mean chapter 4, verses 14 to 17. Then the women said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a close relative. And may his name be famous in Israel. And may he be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is better to you than seven sons, had borne him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him on her bosom and became a nurse to him. Verse 17, very important. Also the neighbor, the neighbor women gave him a name. Can you imagine? Boaz didn't, I mean, Boaz didn't have the privilege of giving his son a name. Ruth didn't give him a name. Even Naomi, the neighbors. And they honored it. The neighbors gave the son, Ruth's son, Naomi's grandson, the name. It's in verse 17 right here. Right? And they called his name Obed. He is the father of Jesse, the father of David. For some reason, we don't know. I don't know. All I know is that it's in the hand of God. So the focus is on Boaz and Ruth, and yet God has not forgotten Naomi. They mentioned, they said, the women said, Naomi also had a son. Not grandson, but a son. Well, because in the first place, he didn't bear any son from, I mean, his, his two sons died, and then now they're claiming that she had another son. Now, when we look at this life, sometimes we cannot help but envy other people because they are prosperous than us. They have more than we have. And sometimes the psalmist also said, Lord, let me not be envious against the unbelievers because they seem to prosper. That's right, right? Those who deny Jesus Christ, they are even the rich people. And God has a reason for that. I don't understand and I don't know. But then we need to focus, we need to be faithful with what God has given to us. Just like what God has given to Boaz, what God has given to Ruth, and what God has given to Naomi. And then finally, we see here, Boaz is a figure that represents how Christ would redeem us. Again, in chapter 4, verse 13, it happened. His prayer in chapter 3, verse 13, happened, and he was the answer to the prayer. And then beginning from verse 18, we see here the generations, the genealogy, the genealogy of Perez. And it came back to a family where, again, it's not a perfect family, right? Who knows, who, who knows who's, uh, who's Perez's mom? Tamar. And Tamar was labeled as a prostitute, although she's not. And who's, uh, who's Perez's dad? Judah, right? Remember the story? When Judah was walking around, she saw uh, someone, and she thought she's a prostitute. But then it's because he did not fulfill his promise to Tamar. And so complicated. But then God works through complications in this life. And that's the amazing thing here. And so Boaz was the picture of the grace and the redeeming power of God. Remember, before we got saved, what, we, what are we? We are dead in sins. We are poor spiritually. We have nothing. 
So those people who are millionaires and billionaires, if they don't have Christ, they don't, they don't have nothing. They have nothing. Because when you have Christ, you have everything. Do you agree with that? If you have Christ in your life, then you have everything. Ask our brothers that are being persecuted in India, in Indonesia, parts of China. Ask them. They're rich. They're rich spiritually. People look at them as nothing. The government look at them as poor, homeless. But because they have Christ, they have everything. You can take their life. You cannot scare them. You cannot threaten them. Remember Paul when he said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain? That is claiming your riches in Christ. Paul says, you cannot threaten me. If you kill me right now, boom, I'll be with Jesus. Thank you. <laughs> but if you let me live, I'll witness to you. I'll preach to you. I'll keep writing Epistles and, and letters and encouragement. So if we are saved, if you have Christ in your heart, you can still work. Of course, we need to work. But those are not the focus of this life, beloved. The focus of our life is Jesus Christ and how we can know him more in this life. So we are spiritually poor and there is no way that we could get back with our perfect relationship with God. And it is through only through Jesus Christ that we had encountered and we had realized that we need salvation. And the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. His death on the cross, His resurrection saved us, beloved. So let me encourage you once again today. If you're struggling with any problem, that is nothing compared to to what you have if you have Christ in your heart. Because if you have Christ in your heart, you have everything in this life. They can take away your car, your home, your property, your bank accounts. You're secure in Christ. I know it's not easy. It's not easy to say that. It's not easy to live that. But I know one of these days when you're lying down in that bed, and you know for sure that there's no way that you're going to survive and that you're going to live longer than one year or six months. That's when I realize, that's when you realize <coughs> that your house, your car, your jewelries, all your possessions mean nothing. If you don't have someone to inherit, the government will take all your properties. They will say, thank you. But you see, if you have Christ, you don't worry about that. Amen? Amen? Praise the Lord. Father in heaven, we thank you. <coughs> that in you, we have everything. That in you, because we have you, there's no amount of threat and riches that can take away this peace in my heart, in our hearts. Thank you for the picture through the life of Boaz that he was willing to sacrifice his finances, his resources to redeem Ruth and Naomi. And we see you, Lord Jesus Christ, as a picture of that, that you have given your life for us so that we can experience through riches in our salvation in our assurance that our names had been written in the book of life. Bless your word in our hearts. We honor you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.